is the amazing story of a friendship. A friendship which sprang up between two inhabitants of the forest. One of these two strange friends is a beaver, shyest of wild things. And the other is Grey Owl, a Canadian backwoodsman, who turned from trapping wild animals to become their protector and champion. His father was a Scot who married a full-blooded Apache Indian in New Mexico. Grey Owl selected Canada as his country of adoption and became in turn a trapper, fire ranger, and guide. When the Great War started, he enlisted in the 13th Montreal Battalion. After being wounded twice, he was invalided back to Canada, where he again took up his old life in the great north country of Quebec and Ontario. On his return, he was appalled by the ruthless destruction of fur-bearing animals caused by the greed of get-rich-quick trappers. And of them all, the beaver seemed to suffer most. The tortures of the trap line, the destruction of dams and lodges, the relentless persecution of this intelligent and sensitive little animal all brought about a strong revulsion of feeling in the mind of Grey Owl. It was then he made his great decision. From that time on, the saving of the beaver from extinction became his life's job, and he is carrying on this work in the great national parks of Canada. The beavers are his friends now and welcome his visits to their colony. One little fellow in particular looks upon Grey Owl as his very special friend, and Grey Owl fondly calls him Little Talking Brother. The two are fast friends and have been almost as long as the little animal can remember. And here is how it all happened. One day while Grey Owl was busy working around his camp, he happened to look over toward the edge of the clearing and saw a tiny ball of fur rolling uncertainly toward him, a baby beaver. The poor little wave was too young and lonely to worry whether Grey Owl was an enemy or not. He only knew that here was the first friendly touch he had felt since that awful day he had found his mother lying cold and skinless at the water's edge. But his whole short life had been turned topsy-turvy. Now, all was peace and quiet and everything seemed to be coming out all right again. This strange food tasted rather nice, too. Yet in all the excitement of his new life, he never forgot his mother's teaching that all good beavers keep themselves neat and tidy. And so the happy days slipped by and Grey Owl's little brother hardly realized that he was growing up, except perhaps in those friendly wrestling matches with Mrs. Grey Owl when he felt so proud of the strength of his muscles. And what an appetite! His mother would have been proud of his table manners, even though she might have been a bit surprised at his forsaking minced poplar leaves and shredded birch bark for fried potatoes, boiled rice, and apples. Life was just one long picnic for baby brother. But he never allowed his new life so carefree and happy, and so different from that of his ancestors, to make him lazy or careless. He was always very particular about his toilet. That was born in him, just as it is in every beaver. And every beaver carries his own barbershop with him. His broad tail makes a useful seat. A loose-jointed claw on his hind foot serves as a comb. And he brushes his coat with strong forepaws. Now it happened one day as he sat there grooming himself in the warm sunshine that he looked up suddenly and saw another beaver swimming toward him. It was so long since he had seen one of his own tribe that he was a bit shy at first, but the newcomer evidently wanted to make friends and before long, little brother was even offering him his food. The call of his kind was strong and almost before he knew it, he was away with his new companion. Matter of fact, this was what Grey Owl wanted. He wants the beavers to be his friends in their natural life. He has no desire to domesticate them or turn them into pampered pets. But even among his new friends, he is never too busy to see Grey Owl, who often comes around for a visit. His familiar call, or the slapping of his paddle on the water is a welcome sound which always brings his little brother flying to meet him. He knows full well that there will be some favorite tidbit of human food for him in the bottom of the canoe.
some morsel which will remind him of those happy days when he was growing up in the Grey Owl household. But this time he can't stay very long. These are busy days in the beaver colony. So with a little squeal of thanks, he hurriedly finishes his morsel and dives away back to the job. Because you see the summer is nearly over and there is a great deal of work yet to be done on the new lodge to make it snug and cozy before the winter freeze up. Wood has to be brought from all directions. Sometimes it is necessary to go far inland to find just the kind that's needed. And then it all has to be dragged piece by piece to the new house and they're prepared for building purposes. And it's hard, steady plugging. A beaver lodge under construction is no place for loafers, but then no beaver was ever known to be a loafer anyway. Usually, there is a great deal of carpentry work to do before the material will fit the place it's needed for. Besides his strong muscles, a beaver's most useful tools are his teeth, which he keeps whetted as sharp as any other good carpenter keeps his chisel. Just notice how quickly he makes a cut. It's a matter of seconds and not minutes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Fifteen seconds! How many carpenters could do that with their teeth? From time to time, he runs over to see his chum, giving him a friendly little nudge and standing by to help with the heavy timbers if he's needed. There, Gray Owl, let's go over and say hello. So away they go together because his chum has learned to love the tall Indian just as little brother does. As always, there is some morsel for them in the bottom of the canoe. But now they must eat and run because the freeze up will soon be here and there is still a lot of work to do. This must be goodbye to Gray Owl till spring and back to work they hurry. Stick after stick is carefully placed to strengthen the walls and roof of the lodge. Marvels of animal engineering are performed in their construction. Some of the larger beaver houses are even built with several partitions forming compartments which have no communication with each other except underwater. The materials they use include driftwood, green willows, birch, poplars, mud and stone. It is easy to see how the expression busy as a beaver came about. As an example of industry and determination, Canada's national animal offers an object lesson which we humans might well emulate. But what's the use of moralizing? There is too much work to be done. It's a case of hurry, hurry, hurry. Winter's nearly here. After the carpenter work is done, plastering begins. There are no labor-saving devices to lighten the work. All the mud which will bind together the framework must be carried up an armful at a time and then pack down hard. This plastering, by the way, is done with the front feet and not as is sometimes supposed by the tail, which is only used as a rudder in swimming. All day long, it's up and back, up and back. Hurry, 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 winter's nearly here. the walls become almost as solid and hard as stone, able to stand against floods and ice and so that neither wolves nor other enemies can disturb their repose. At last the job is done. There is perhaps a little last strengthening of the main entrance with mud, a final inspection and Grey Owl's little brothers are all ready for the long winter's night. 